Okay, we're going to look at another optimization problem. Um, so this one is sort of a classic problem that you see in calculus classes a lot. And um, the algebra and calculus isn't that hard, but it's a little bit hard to think about how to set this up. So I wanted to do an example of one like this. All right, so we're going to make an open rectangular box from a flat 18 by 48 piece of cardboard cut squares out of the corners and fold up the sides. All right, so I'm going to draw a little diagram over here, just making sure we're clear about what exactly is going to happen. So we've got this rectangle, flat rectangular piece of cardboard that is 18 inches by 48 inches. And we're going to snip out of the corners little squares. So they're going to be squares. That'll be important that they're square. And then we'll fold up the sides. So we'll basically fold along these dashed lines that I made there. And then we'll have a three-dimensional box from that open top box. And I guess we'd have to tape the edges there to make it a really three-dimensional box. OK, so the idea is we take this flat piece, snip out the sides, and we fold up the edges to get this box. It's a little hard to visualize that, but you can probably imagine doing that with a piece of cardboard. Um, all right, so uh, we know that this is an optimization problem because we're trying to find the dimensions of the box that give us the largest volume. So that's telling us we want to maximize the volume. And um, so we're going to use calculus to do that. We always start with a diagram. So we've started with that a little bit. I'm going to add one other little description here. Uh, so there's a lot going on here, but I want to think about how we initially constructed the box. We cut these little squares out of the corner. And so the question really is, how big do you need to cut those squares so that you can get this optimal size box? All right, so I'm going to label each side of those little squares x. So they're all going to be little squares, x by x squares, the same in each corner. Uh, and then what I want to think about, though, is actually maximizing the volume of the box. So I want to use this diagram of the flat piece with the corners cut out to think about the dimensions of the box. So when I fold up those edges, that height of the box is going to be this x distance. That's one edge on that square. Uh, and then I'm going to have one side of the box that this part that that is this part that's left here, this part that I've dashed in here. So I've got this 48 inch side and I've cut these two little squares out of each corner. So I've cut x inches off of each end here. So that side on my three dimensional box here will be 48 minus 2x. Right, so that's this distance here between those two little corners. And then on the other side, I started with 18 inches and cut x off of each end. So that side that's dashed there would be 18 minus 2x. So those are the dimensions of my three-dimensional box. And I think that's the hardest part of this problem, is getting from the information that was given in the problem to the actual box that you're supposed to be uh, finding the maximum volume of. All right, so we've got our diagram. Uh, another thing that we always want to do at the beginning of these problems is think about our objective function. So the objective function is about what you want to maximize or minimize. All right, so we want to maximize the volume of this box. So I need to write a formula that gives the volume of this box. So volume of a box is length times width times height. So just the product of all those things. I'll put the x out front. So there's our volume equation. Uh, another thing that we often do in these problems is think about a constraint. We actually don't need a constraint in this one. So I'm just going to put not applicable in this problem. Uh, the volume equation that we have here is just in terms of one variable. So we use that constraint often when we've got an objective function that we want to maximize or minimize. And it includes more than one variable in here. Now, depending on how I set up this problem, maybe that would have happened if I would have started with a volume that is, say, L times W times H, length times width times height. My constraint maybe would have involved how I relate the length, width, and height to this x variable. But in this one, because I wrote them all based on the diagram, all in terms of x, I don't actually need a constraint for this one. So not every problem has a constraint in it. Depends how many variables you have as inputs for your objective function. Another important part of all of these problems is thinking about the feasible domain. So I'm going to go over here and look at the picture a little bit and think about that. 
Um, so the feasible domain, uh, my input variable here is x. So it's really thinking about how big x could be uh, that we could have this sort of box here. So certainly x is going to have to be greater than 0, or I wouldn't be snipping out any corners and I couldn't uh, create a box here. But there's also a biggest possible value that x could be. So if I look at the shorter side of my rectangular piece of cardboard here, uh, I, I have two of those pieces of size x. So if those were 9 inches in width, those little corners I snipped out, then I would be snipping out that whole side that's 18 inches. So I need that x to actually be less than 9 uh, for the dimensions in order to be able to cut out these corners and still have pieces left to fold up a box. So this is our feasible domain. That's our feasible domain. So we'll need to kind of think about that uh, when we do the problem here. If we get x values that are outside of that interval, we will say those don't make sense in the problem and discard them. All right, so uh, the next thing that we usually do after we've written our constraint is substitute into the objective function, but I don't need to do that here since I have only one variable. So we're going to want to find critical points. Uh, so I'll need a derivative. So I could take the derivative of this function as it's written, but probably it's easier if I just do a little bit of algebra first and multiply this all out so that I can then just take the derivative of a polynomial instead of having to use a couple of different product rules like I have here. So first I'm going to simplify that objective function. So this is v, not v prime yet. I'm going to skip a little bit of algebra here. I'm going to look at my little notes to make sure I don't mess this up. All right, so we're going to FOIL that out and then distribute through an x. We'll have some like terms we can combine. I'm going to go ahead and write the simplified version down here. Um, we'll have a minus 2x times a minus 2x will be a 4x squared and then times the other x here. So we'll have a 4x cubed for the highest power term. Um, we'll have a 48 times the negative 2x, so negative 96x, and then a negative 2x times 18, so negative 36x. So a negative 96 plus a negative 36x will be negative 132x, for the middle term there, and then distribute that x through. So negative 132x squared. Uh, and then for the constant term, when I multiply these together, 48 times 18 is 864, and then times that other x there. All right, so you get some calculator out to help you with the arithmetic there, but uh, this is our v function here, but in order to find the critical points, we want the v prime, the derivative. So I'm being careful here and making sure I label the original function and the derivative. Um, 264x plus 864. Uh, I want to set that derivative equal to 0 and solve for x. Um, this one, uh, I can factor some things out from this point. At this point, this is quadratic. So if you can't factor, you could use quadratic formula to help you with that. This one does factor. There is a 12 that I can factor out of all of this. Um, 12 goes into 264 22 times, and 12 goes into 864 72 times. All right, so that helps with the algebra a little bit. Um, this quadratic equation that's left here, uh, x squared minus 22x plus 72, when I set that part equal to 0, that also factors, although it's maybe not so obvious that it factors. So maybe you use quadratic formula to do that. Um, when I set this part equal to 0, uh, and then I use quadratic formula, I'll get x equals positive 22 uh, for the negative b plus or minus the square root of uh, negative 22 squared minus 4 times 1 times 72, all inside the radical there, all over 2 times 1. All right, so then you get out your calculator and you let that help you with some of this arithmetic here. Uh, when you do that, you simplify, and on this one, it, it is kind of nice. I made sure the numbers were nice in this problem. You shouldn't always expect them to be that way. Um, but what I get inside the radical here is happens to be a perfect square. Um, maybe that doesn't turn out to be a perfect square, and you have to leave it as an unsimplified square root. Um, but this one does, so square root of 196 is 14, uh, so 22 plus 14 uh, would be 36 divided by 2, so I get 18, and then 22 minus 
14 would be 8 divided by 2 and I get 4. All right, so those are my true critical points. This is where that feasible domain is important to think about. That 18 doesn't actually work in the statement of the problem. So that one is not in the feasible domain. It is a solution. It's a critical point of this equation, but it's not actually going to work in our optimization problem here. So I actually only have one critical point that's in the feasible domain here. So this is our x value. Um, I need to test to determine whether that x value actually gives me a local minimum or a local maximum. So I can use either a first derivative test or a second derivative test to do that. Uh, I'm just going to go over here and look at a second derivative test really quick. And I'm running out of space. Uh, I'm going to use the second derivative, v double prime. Uh, so I'll have 24x minus 264. I want to evaluate that at x equals 4, so v double prime of 4. And I don't really care so much about the value of this answer. I care about the sign of this answer. So when I simplify all this, I get a negative value for that second derivative when x equals 4, which tells me that at that critical point, the function is concave down. So we do have a local maximum at that point. So that really is a maximum uh, that maximizes the volume of the function. All right, and then from there, it's just a matter of making sure we answer the question. So we're going to go back to the word problem and make sure we answer what was asked. Uh, it asked us several things here, actually. What are the dimensions of the box of largest volume? Right, so my diagram here can help with that. It's asking us for the length, width, and height of the box. So x equals 4 inches is going to be our height. And then 18 minus 2 times 4, that will be 10 inches for the width. And then 48 minus 2 times 4, that will be 40 inches for the length of the box. So the box will be 4 inches by 10 inches by 40 inches. And then it also asks us, uh, what is its volume? So I also need to calculate that volume, so the length times the width times the height. So 4 times 10 times 40. So multiply that out, 1,600. And that would be in cubic inches, would be the maximum volume. So there's the answer to the question that we were asked. All right, so again, the calculus isn't too hard. The algebra is not too bad here. Uh, I think the hardest part of a problem like this is getting that diagram set up and sort of translating. So when you see some in your homework like that, try to remember this original setup, and that'll help with the rest of the problem.